So let's talk about, first I'm gonna talk about their, how they secrete hydrochloric acid. So let's go over that mechanism. So here's a parietal cell. I'm gonna draw the bloodstream and the gastric lumen just to kind of give you a little bit of frame of reference here. Parietal cells secrete hydro, uh, hydrogen ions into the gastric lumen by using this hydrogen potassium ATPase. So for every hydrogen that goes into the lumen, it needs to reabsorb one potassium. Uh, I'm gonna spend this time talking about the alkaline tide because I think it's relevant. We can't just secrete hydrogen ions into the gastric lumen willy nilly. We have to get that hydrogen from somewhere. And so I wanted to talk about how that works. The alkaline tide actually shows that your blood pH will increase when you use to, when you are producing so much gastric acid, and it's because of this mechanism right here. So, if you have carbon dioxide in water, you can use carbonic anhydrase, and you can convert that what was CO two in water. You can convert that to bicarbonate and a hydrogen ion, and so for that hydrogen ion can then leave into the lumen. But this bicarb, for every hydrogen ion that goes, this bicarb is going to leave into the bloodstream. So your blood's going to become more basic while your lumen of your uh, stomach is going to become more acidic. And that's called the alkaline tide. So after you eat, if you measured your pH of your blood, it would actually be a little bit higher um, after eating. And for every bicarb that comes in, you can get chloride that comes into the cell and out as well. And so that's how you get HCl into your gastric lumen. I've only described a very, very small percentage of how that works. So let's actually go through what activates this process and what stops the process. So here's our activators and here's our inhibitors. Let's start with the vagus nerve to talk about how the vagus nerve can activate all this. So let's first start talking about the vagus M3 pathway. So the vagus nerve can secrete acetylcholine and that acetylcholine can bind to an M3 receptor this is pretty similar to what we were seeing in our oral cavity lecture. And that can, the M3 receptor can activate a GQ pathway, which activates a bunch of intracellular mechanisms. You have your IP3 DAG pathway, your protein kinase C and calcium, and all of that combined can finally activate this enzyme, the H plus, K plus ATPase, okay? So, if you give somebody atropine, which inhibits the M3 receptor, you would think that it would stop any gastric acid secretions. But as Morpheus might tell you, atropine doesn't stop the hydrogen potassium ATPase that well. The reason is that the vagus nerve actually has two pathways by which to activate this enzyme. So let's talk about the GRP pathway now. So instead of going down the acetylcholine pathway, the M3 pathway, the vagus nerve can activate, can release GRP. And GRP, gastrin releasing peptide, as you might have expected, it can uh, activate G cells to secrete gastrin. We already know G cells are our gas cells. So they're gonna secrete gastrin. And we know gastrin increases, uh, is kind of the go button, the on switch for hydrogen ion secretion. So what gastrin will do is it'll bind to the CCKB receptor and go through the same GQ pathway to activate um, the H plus K plus ATPase. So if we talk about atropine versus the vagotomy, so if you give somebody atropine, yeah, it'll shut down this pathway, but you can still get hydrogen ion secretion through this pathway. On the other hand, if you block the vagus nerve completely, like if you cut the vagus nerve in a vagotomy, well, you won't get either of these pathways. So a vagotomy would more effectively inhibit a hydrogen ion secretion. The last pathway I wanna talk about is the histamine pathway. So gastrin, in addition to binding to the CCKB receptor and going through this pathway, uh, gastrin can also go through a different pathway where it activates ECL cells to produce histamine. And this histamine can go and bind to an H2 receptor, and that, that can start an intracellular cascade with a G sub S protein that'll activate cyclic AMP, and ultimately you'll, you'll get activation of the same enzyme. If we talk about inhibitors now, 
I'm going to clear a little bit of the left side of the screen for us. What's going to happen is that these inhibitors can bind to their own receptors, which are G sub I coupled, and G sub I coupled proteins are known for uh, inhibiting cyclic AMP. So it'll bind to the cyclic AMP and inhibit that whole process. So you won't get any, you won't get as much, I should say, uh, hydrogen ion secretion. While we're here, I'd like to just briefly discuss the pharmacology of how some of these um, medications work to inhibit hydrogen ion secretion or inhibit GERD symptoms like heartburn symptoms. We'll start with PPIs. So PPIs, their mechanism is they can directly inhibit this hydrogen potassium ATPase, and that's what makes them so effective. No matter which pathway you choose, the end result is that this enzyme gets inhibited. And we see PPIs used in several different modalities. We talked about it in GERD. We're gonna see it in gastritis, peptic ulcer disease, Zollinger-Ellison syndrome, and it can also be used as part of H. pylori therapy. There's some notable side effects you should realize. When we are inhibiting this, we're not getting as much acid into our stomach. And sometimes that stomach acid can be useful to kill some bacteria for us. So you might get some infections. You can get C. diff. You can get something called SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, which we talk about later in the small intestine lecture. You can also get pneumonias as well. So it's it's it can be that it can hurt you sometimes if you don't have as much acid there to protect you. Another thing that can happen is that you can get malabsorption because some compounds need some acid to either cleave a bond or they need it for to enhance absorption. And the last thing. I just want you to realize is that PPIs are known for as a cause of acute interstitial nephritis. I got to be honest with you. I don't think I've seen PPIs tested uh, um, regarding AIN. It's usually um, usually diuretics, painkillers, penicillins I've seen. Oftentimes it's NSAID use though on a test question. I just wanted to remind you, I know we're not doing a kidney lecture, but as you can see, PPIs are one of the, the five common offenders that they like you to remember for step one as causes of acute interstitial nephritis. Let's move on to talk about histamine blockers or antihistamines. So these obviously, as their name suggests, they'll inhibit the H2 receptor here. Uh, some of the names that you might be familiar with are ranitidine, famotidine, cimetidine. And again, they're used for some of the same things. They're used less often because they're less efficacious. And it makes sense that they're less efficacious because the PPI could inhibit the, the enzyme that's causing this whole thing to happen. Whereas these guys can only stop one part of the pathway. You can still get hydrogen ion production through this pathway, even if your H2 receptor is blocked. Some side effects, they really like to test cimetidine side effects more than anything. Just know that it's a P450 inhibitor. Uh, and just know its associations with gynecomastia and impotence. You could know that it crosses the placenta, but that's a little lower yield. They usually test it in the context of gynecomastia or that it's a P50 inhibitor. So you have to watch out for those interactions. And last thing I wanted to talk about are antacids. How do they work? Is they bind free hydrogen ions in your lumen. So let's say you have some hydrogen ions in your lumen. You can get either aluminum hydroxide or magnesium hydroxide. And then these can dissociate into hydroxyl ions, and those can actually bind and neutralize the, the acid in the stomach to create water. And the side effects you have to know with these is that aluminum hydroxide causes constipation and magnesium hydroxide causes diarrhea. And a helpful mnemonic is that aluminum gives you minimum feces, so you get constipated, and magnesium gives you megafeces or diarrhea. Last thing I want to talk about before we move on to some things about intrinsic factor is this hypokalemic, hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis. This is highly tested. And this is a laboratory finding. What often they'll do is they'll just say somebody's vomiting or they won't even tell you about the patient. They'll just give you lab values and they'll make you realize that it's a hypokalemic, hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis. And that should tell you that they might be vomiting severely. I've seen this in the context of like a 
young woman who comes in and they don't say anything about her. They just say she's really sick. She's like, you know, somnolent in the ED and they get labs and they show this pattern and you can see that she's got dental caries already. And you have to think, oh, maybe she's got bulimia and you have to, you know, act accordingly to replenish her electrolytes. So how does this actually happen? The hypokalemia occurs because as you're losing a bunch of fluid through vomiting, your body has to try to retain fluid to keep your blood pressures up. So what will happen is your kidneys will try to preserve as much sodium as they can so that you still have a good, uh, that, that sodium can pull water in and you can keep some, some fluid within your bloodstream to maintain your blood pressures. The problem with that is for every sodium that you keep, your body's going to excrete potassium. So you're going to be hypokalemic. The hypochloremia makes a lot of sense because you're directly losing chloride in the lumen. And the metabolic alkalosis should make sense because if you remember from our discussion of the alkaline tide earlier, if you have to keep producing all this hydrogen, you're going to gain bicarb. And you're, and obviously, if you lose an acid in general by throwing it up, you're going to gain base, relatively speaking. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. Please like comment, and subscribe for more content.